In its long history, the mother of all parliaments had seen few issues so protracted and so bitterly fought over as the issue of Irish Home Rule. From the time it was first introduced by Gladstone in 1886, the issue of Home Rule had been to the forefront of British political life. In 1914, the Irish Parliamentary Party leader John Redmond was about to succeed where Charles Stuart Parnell had failed almost 30 years previously. Home Rule for Ireland was within his grasp. We'll have a Parliament sitting in College Green sooner than the most enthusiastic man in this crowd believes, he told his supporters. The Liberal Government of Herbert Asquith depended on the Irish Parliamentary Party for support and was determined in any case to bring in Home Rule. Home Rule was an idea whose time had come. Twice the Home Rule Bill had been passed by the House of Commons. Twice it was rejected by the unelected House of Lords. But in 1914 the Lords could no longer veto it a third time. But as the prospects of Home Rule grew ever more certain, so too did opposition. Dublin-born Unionist Edward Carson had rallied the Protestants of Ulster to resist Home Rule by force if necessary. In 1912, a half million Northern Protestants signed the Ulster Covenant, pledging to do what was necessary to retain the link with Britain. For Carson, Home Rule was the most nefarious conspiracy ever hatched against a free people. They had important allies too, not only in the Conservative Party, but in elements of the army. In March 1914, at Curragh Camp in County Kildare, some 60 British Army officers offered to resign their commissions than move against Ulster. Their stand almost brought down the Asquith government. In April 1914, at the Port of Larne, the Ulster Volunteer Force imported some 25,000 guns from a Hamburg arms dealer under the noses of the British government. Nevertheless, in May, the third Home Rule Bill passed all stages of Parliament and needed only the King's assent, but the issue of Ulster had not been resolved. Here at Buckingham Palace in late July 1914, three days of talks between the Liberal government, Unionists and Nationalists ended without agreement. But as those talks concluded, an even greater menace to peace was looming. The assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife had brought the world closer to catastrophe than most people knew at the time. Austria had made Serbia an offer she couldn't accept. Churchill wrote, The parishes of Fermanagh and Tyrone faded into the mists and squalls of Ireland and a strange light began immediately but by perceptible gradations to fall and grow upon the map of Europe. The talks broke up without agreement. Three days later, the Irish volunteers who had pledged to uphold the promise of home rule landed guns and ammunition at Hoth. There were now two armed militias in Ireland and a potentially divided British army. But events elsewhere soon intervened. At 11 p.m. on August the 4th, 1914, Britain declared war on Germany. Time had run out for Home Rule. In September 1914, the Home Rule Bill became law, but its implementation was suspended until the end of the war. Redmond urged that Irish men should go, he said, wherever the firing line extends. The war, he said, was undertaken in defence of the highest principles of religion and morality and right. Tens of thousands of Irishmen signed up to the British war effort. Observing the rush to arms, militant Republicans who wanted a complete break with Britain were appalled. 
The reaction of the Irish people after the declaration of war filled me with the conviction that we had reached a point where the Irish people had accepted their absorption by the British, wrote the Irish rebel Desmond Fitzgerald. In that state of mind, I had decided that extreme action must be taken.